Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. My name is Evan Wittenberg, and I head up global leadership development here at Google. And it is my uh, distinct honor and pleasure to introduce and welcome my former colleague and good friend, Professor Mike Yuseem, to Google. Uh, I've been trying to get Mike here for three years, ever since I started. Um, Mike is the Egan Professor of Management at the Wharton School and has been teaching there for 15 years or so. And uh, he also is the director of Wharton Center for Leadership and Change. He's written countless books, um, all of which get wonderful reviews and are really good reads. And uh, I could talk to you all day about Mike and what a great leader he is and colleague he is, but I thought it would be better to uh, have somebody who is a former student of Mike's come up and tell you a little bit about him. So uh, Gopi Kalil, um, who's the uh, lead for product marketing, the product marketing team for search advertising and a uh, former student of Mike's gonna come up and do that part of the introduction. Thanks, Evan. So in 2002, I had a momentary <coughs> lapse of reason and signed up for an experiential leadership program that took us all on an expedition to Mount Everest base camp. Due to political trouble in Nepal that year, the expedition leader decided to move the expedition to Mount Kanchanchunga in the Himalayas. It's the third highest mountain in the world and extremely demanding. The course was intended to be an experiential leadership course. So on the first day, the leader of the program asked me to be leader for a day. And on that very first day, we were caught in the midst of the worst oh, Himalayan storm I'd ever Great seen. Great job, thank you. This is fierce winds. That's experiential leadership with Matt Kowinski on the other end. So we were caught in this worst Himalayan storm that I'd ever seen with crazy winds and sheets of ice everywhere. One of the members of the group, Lynn Dan, told me that evening as she was sitting in this tent about to be blown away that this was her first ever night out in a tent <laughs> and how terrified she was. So these situations involve real you know, difficult life situations because during that one day I had to make decisions that took into account the safety and well-being of the other members of the group, the Sherpas, and even the yaks that carried our baggage up the mountains. The leader of that expedition was Mike Kasim. And this is how he teaches his student leadership, but not by using two-by-two two metrics, but by actually putting people in the midst of difficult life situations where you have to call forth your leadership that can affect the life and well-being of other people. I've had the pleasure, privilege, and honor of being Mike's student at the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania, where, as Evan mentioned, he's also the director for Le Center for Leadership Thank and you. Change. And yes, Mike is a scholar. He's the author of more than five books, including his latest, which he'll talk about today, The Go Point, When It's Time to Decide. But what has endeared Mike to me as a teacher is the fact that he is a fantastic storyteller. And the way he likes to teach leadership is by either putting his students in certain situations or making them walk through the leadership situations of other leaders who may have led Everest expeditions or led smoke jumpers or been in Civil War battlefields. With that as an introduction, I'm delighted to present before you Professor Mike Asim from the Wharton School. Mike. <laughs> All right, everybody, good afternoon. <laughs> good. <laughs> You're about to do this as a tandem. Uh, anyway, uh, my privilege to be here. I know this is a very brief opportunity for us to have a dialogue, and we're really going to make it a dialogue. So we're going to make this an uh, active workshop. Be ready. A couple of people have helped me out with uh, some of your names. So I know that uh, Paul is sitting right over here. So, Paul, you'll be ready, right? And right behind uh, Paul, I think, is uh, Jenny, right? Okay, so be ready, Jenny, for a throwback of uh, a dialogue here. I'm going to start this way. The topic is making decisions, and it's almost true by definition. If you think about Meg Whitman, maybe your future governor, or the current governor, or John McCain, or Hillary Clinton, or Barack Obama, people in a position of leadership responsibilities do have to be ready to make good 
and timely decisions, good and timely. That's a formulation because often those two criteria for decision making work against each other. In fact, we have a phrase to indicate uh, maybe one end of a spectrum. If somebody shoots from the hip, they've made a decision that's fast, but it may not be very good. Other end of the spectrum, analysis paralysis. Perfect decision, it just took a long time to reach it. We want to find the sweet spot somehow in between. We want it to be good and timely. And that's the agenda I'm going to work with you for literally about 35 minutes here. It's going to work best if you wouldn't mind, since this is a workshop, if you would think now about the decisions you have made, the decisions people that you have admired in politics or at this company or in the community they have made, start thinking about what makes for good and timely decisions. Thanks. This is about making decisions when somebody else is looking to you for the leadership you are obliged to exercise. To get us going on the premise that I think we often think about these issues most tangibly, which also means most memorably, if we can see these ideas embedded in experience, your own or that of others. So I have a test here. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Paul to see if he can uh, answer this question. Paul, or Jenny for that matter, I challenge you, I think you're not going to be able to answer this question, to help us remember who Gustavus W. Smith is. Gustavus W. Smith. That, this is a really, this is a tough one. This is obscure. But Jenny, you remember who Robert E. Lee is, right? A Confederate general, Robert E. Lee. Paul, you're okay on that? Okay. Strictly speaking, keep this in mind. Robert E. Lee, one of the great commanders of the Confederacy, was preceded in office by, by a Gustavus W. Smith. I'd like you to see what he looked like. This will help us focus on what we're referencing here. Gustavus Smith, upper left-hand corner. I think everybody is just blinking. You've, you've thought about Jeb Stewart and Ulysses S. Grant and Robert E. Lee and George Meade and Sheridan and Sherman, but we're a little bit stuck on Smith, even though he was one of the Confederacy's great commanding officers. And here's why he's totally forgettable. June 1st, 1862, it's a tough to see map up there. The United States in mortal conflict now with the Confederacy, which is created in 1861. South Carolina quits, 11, uh, 10 other states join to form the CS of A, Confederate States of America. And in the spring of 1862, the United States, the 22 remaining states, decide, it decides to end the Civil War, 1862, it, of course, won't end until 1865, but the U.S. decides to end the war in 1862, or at least it thought it could, Abraham Lincoln, presiding leader of the moment, by sending a force, arrow on the right-hand side of that photograph, or that map, rather, there from Washington down to what is then called, still is called, Fort Monroe, not too far from Norfolk, Virginia, and to march up what is called then, still called, the Peninsula, to attack Richmond, the capital of the Confederacy. The premise, a little bit false, but accepted at the time, is if you could capture Jefferson Davis, president of the breakaway Confederate States of America, and take over his White House in Richmond, Virginia, maybe capture a good bit of the defending forces, that could end the Civil War. That's the plan. So 125,000 U.S. soldiers are landed at Fort Monroe, lower right-hand corner in that map, and they begin to march in a northwestern direction towards Richmond. A little hard to see, but it's in the upper left-hand corner there. If you're <coughs> Jefferson Davis, you're concerned about the army that's defending the capital. It's about 65,000 strong only, led by commanding officer Joseph Johnston outnumbered two to one. Of course, you got home court advantage. Johnston is defending Richmond, home, home field. Still, two to one. It does not look maybe all that promising for Jefferson Davis because he knows if he's captured, he'll probably be hung. So there's a little bit of a personal concern here, not to mention his concern about the future of the country 
that leads him in an era without any Nexus One telephones or even a Blackberry to go out to see what's going on on the front line. It's hard to believe there was such an era, but in 1862, May 31st, 1862 anyway, Joseph Johnston, the commanding officer of the Confederate force that is preventing the fall of Richmond, the front line of Joe Johnston's defensive line around Richmond is only about five miles from the center of town. Jefferson Davis, president, rides out as if, as if Barack Obama decides to pick up and go to Kandahar, Afghanistan, to see what's going on directly in the field. That's exactly what Joe Johnston now has at his back as his boss, Jeff Davis, comes out to take a look. Jefferson Davis, within a few feet of Joe Johnston, sees Joe hit by shrapnel and a bullet at the same time. This is May 31st, 1862. Not fatal. Jefferson Davis walks over and says uh, something like this, Joe, you're not looking too good right now. And Joe says, well, sir, I've been uh, maybe mortally wounded, to tell you the truth. It's not, but it's a very serious injury. And so Joe <coughs> Johnson is asked by Jeff Davis, Jefferson Davis, to show the right, right respect here, is asked uh, who his replacement is that hopefully will defend Richmond against its imminent overrun by the United States of America. He says, my number two guy, Gustavus W. Smith, is my able replacement. Gustavus W. Smith, a career which actually looks very good, a bearing which is professional, sounded look like, has a CV that is very leadership-like as well, looks like a leader, acts like a leader, the resume says it all. West Point has risen up to be the number two person in the army that's defending Richmond against its imminent, its imminent overrunning by the United States. He, uh, on the spot, this is a literal statement now, gets a battlefield promotion. So Gustavus Smith, his boss down, Jeff Davis walks over and says, uh, Gus, <laughs> you're it. I hereby appoint you commanding officer of the Army of Northern Virginia, and you're going <laughs> to prevent my hanging. I uh, hope, you, hope you got some ideas on how to do that. Gustavus Smith, this hand, gives a salute. Thank you for the battlefield promotion. I've always wanted to be a commanding officer. I'm going to write home about this. My kids are going to show me some respect now. At that point, Jefferson Davis says to uh, Gustavus W. Smith, Gus, now that you're in charge of saving the Confederacy, what's your plan? And Gustavus Smith, keep in mind he's number two. This is as if Joe Biden suddenly becomes president. He's probably had to think about what he might do. Gustavus Smith, though, says, uh, give me a few minutes to think about that, sir. That's uh, a little bit of a setback to uh, his president. Jefferson Davis wanders off, returns 24 hours later, and says, uh, Joe, uh, Gus rather, Gus, you've had time now to give, uh, to give some thought to your strategic plan. What is it? And Gustavus W. Smith famously or infamously says, sir, to tell you the truth, I've got no plan. Do you have any good ideas? <laughs> now, Jeff Davis had many well-known flaws, one of which, though, it was not, was he, he was able to make good and timely decisions. He said on the spot, Gus, I hate to tell you, but you are history. Actually, the opposite. Well, we use that phrase, you're history, you're fired, and Gustavus W. Smith becomes, in a sense, part of our non-history, completely forgotten, but he is fired 24 hours later because Jeff De Jefferson Davis had a great leader, a commanding officer of a huge army, 65,000 strong, that when all of a sudden given command, put in a leadership position, could not take command, unable to make a decision, unable to even conjure up a plan within which to make decisions. At this point, to finish off this account, Jefferson Davis says, to his military aide standing right over here named Robert E. Lee. Davis says, uh, Bob, are you busy right now? 
<laughs> and Lee says, well, of course not, sir, whatever you, whatever you would like. Uh, Robert E. Lee, a long career in the armed services. When the war begins, he is still a colonel, which is below a general officer, but now he's the military aide to Jefferson Davis. And on June 1st, 1862, here's the phrase, Robert E. Lee comes to command. It's a phrase. Jeff Davis says to Lee, with Gustavus Smith gone, I'd like you to become the commanding officer of the Army of Northern Virginia. Lee takes command, didn't look a whole lot different from Gustavus Smith by way of resume, by way of deportment, demeanor, you name it. But the difference was Lee could make decisions, timely, never perfect, but usually pretty good, and Smith could not. Hence, in the United States now, there are about 60 Robert E. Lee elementary schools. There are no Gustavus W. Smith elementary schools, and arguably one difference among several is that Robert E. Lee was pretty good at the art of making good and timely decisions. Just to finish this off, to make the point, Lee takes command June 1st. The forward observers for the Union Army, called the Army of the Potomac, can see the spires of downtown Richmond, but that's as close as they're ever gonna get. Lee takes command, makes a series of somewhat, sometimes flawed, but usually very timely decisions, and ultimately pushes an army twice its size away from Richmond, off the peninsula. And by the way, the Union Army, it's a name some of you will recall, the Union Army is commanded by a 34-year-old named George McClellan. And when McClellan, with twice the force that Lee has, is defeated by Lee on the peninsula, Abraham Lincoln fires McClellan for the first of two times. McClellan, a little bit also known for the analysis paralysis, one end of the pole. He was a commanding officer, fantastic. Soldiers loved him, and they loved him in part because he would wait until everything was perfect before he would do anything with the army. He had a case of analysis paralysis. It was often said during that era, George McClellan would like every soldier who ever worked for him to retire as a veteran never having fired a shot <laughs> because everything was not perfect ever for McClellan before he would finally issue an order to attack. Lee had, did not suffer from analysis paralysis. He defeats McClellan on the peninsula. I know the prolo prolongation of the Confederacy is not necessarily something we admire, probably is not. But the point I want to leave us with is the difference between a Robert E. Lee and a Gustavus W. Smith is not the ability to think strategically. They were both pretty good at that. They both look like a leader ought to look, call that demeanor, but one of the enormous and enduring and historical differences, one could make good and timely decisions, the other could not. My guess is many of you have worked for a boss along the way. You don't fit this description, but a boss who was either suffering from shooting from the hip or analysis paralysis, one end of the spectrum or the other. We're gonna work for a few minutes on getting a formula to find the sweet spot so we can make good and timely decisions. I'm gonna add a couple thoughts from the field of research and experience on this, but before I do that, uh, Paul, if you can get us going, I'm gonna ask you to use your best stage voice so everybody can hear. What do you think defines, for you personally, wh what is the factor that helps you make good and timely decisions? Sure, so I just made the comment that uh, uh, what is good decision making all about? To me, it's a matter of having confidence that you're ready to make the decision. When are you ready is when you have um, a well thought through rationale that's, that usually is database, and I think especially at Google we prize that, uh, rather than just making decisions based on, uh, on emotions. But if you think about leadership more generally, think about yourself, think about people that lead this company, the people that you may work for, people m who may work for you, Active listening is a pretty good quality. To hear what the customers want, what people are looking in for in terms of value proposition. So hear what Paul has said, and now we're gonna hear from Jenny in an active listening sense. 
Um, I have to agree with Paul. I think data is a really important factor in making any decision. And I think it'd also be helpful to have a vision um, and data that supports um, both things that agree with that vision and maybe um, aspects of that vision that might not um, end up panning out. So data to support both sides. Great, Jenny, thank you. Well put. At this point, uh, I think I'll give up in the cold calling. Thank you for being cold called and willing to stand up here. Who else would like to add a thought here? Making good and timely decisions. This is going to get Rachel off the hook if we can get somebody here to volunteer. Rachel, I guess it's going to be you. Would you mind? Thank you. I'd like to thank Gopi for giving me my name. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I, I think a, an important quality in a good decision maker is the ability to look past the immediate impact and understand how your influence how your decision will influence the um, outcome further down the road and being able to plan for that and um, factor that into your decision process. Great. Very well, uh, very well put. Thank you on that one. Anybody else want to volunteer a thought? And I think there's some value, there is value in doing this. It's pretty much your work in philosophy. We're all collectively responsible and all of us can think better about just about anything if we pool our collective knowledge. I think, I see a hand here? Oh, thank you. Would you mind standing up with the microphone? I think at a certain level, you have to be comfortable with winging it. You do. And say more about that. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, I mean, personally, my personal style is I tend to have analysis paralysis. Um, but, no uh, but because the data, you always want the data to be complete. And it's, it's, it's probably never complete, but in the short term and the timely side of things, it's really not complete. So I guess if you're really on top of it and you're, and, and you're gonna set up as a good leader, you've probably done some preparation beforehand. So you kind of are already on the right track, but then you just wing it and stick to it. Good, great. Tell us who you are. Oh, Sam Horn. Thank you very much. Now. Let's take the, uh, these four great statements. I'm going to add from the world of academic research and a little experience a couple more thoughts. By the way, though, as we develop our framework for making good and timely decisions, it's a completely pointless exercise if we can't take those ideas and translate them into what we do. So we're going to worry a little bit about taking ideas into action, concept into behavior. That's all a way of giving you the heads up we have a final exam coming in about 10 minutes. So be alert. I want you to use some of these ideas. Here are a couple more thoughts to flesh out or add to what you've just heard. I'm going to skip over a couple items here. Has anybody in this room worked with uh, John Chambers directly over the years? Okay, he's a little, is he up the street or down the street from here? I forget which way he, anyway, south. south. Okay, uh, John Chambers, he is a survivor. You know that, 1995 came to run Cisco Systems, and he's pretty well known for many things. He's got a great stage presence, comes out of marketing, knows how to run an offsite. He's also given to a pretty good record of friendly acquisition. Now, you've done a lot of that. He's got a record of building partly organically Cisco from what it was to what it is, but partly through many, many, many always friendly acquisitions. Many companies are called to sell out to John, few are chosen. His track record, generally speaking, by at least academic assessment, is pretty good for picking winners and avoiding those that he should not have acquired. I had read that, ran into John Chambers at an event a couple years ago, and I offered up the following, John, you're pretty well known for making good decisions when it comes to acquisition. What's your secret? This is what he offered up. He said, uh, well, let's see. Proposal comes my way from my strategy team. The investment bank, our outside advisor, has given us a valuation that we ought to be ready to pay up around. And then my secret is the following. Before I decide, and it's always, these are binary, either we buy or we don't, I turn to my two secret weapons. 
Larry Carter and John Morgridge. Larry Carter, Chief Financial Officer. Larry Morgridge, former CEO and now non-executive at that time, a couple years ago, chair of the board. Larry Carter's gone, but at the time he was CFO. I said, okay, well, when you turn to them, what's the deal? And he says, investment bank has done its thing, strategy team has done its due diligence, and then I say, Larry, what do you really think? Is this a good deal for us or not? And then I turn to Morgridge. John, what do you think? And then John Chambers completely stumped me, stopped me on the spot when he said the following. I go to Larry and I go to John Morgridge because they know the company, number one, as well as I do. I get a second extremely informed opinion and equally importantly, they don't want my job. <laughs> and I'm thinking, what does that have to do with getting a good piece of internal advice. So I said, John, what do you mean by that? So what did he mean by that? They're, to use a scientific phrase, they're not kissing up. So more objective. Now that's such a statement. Actually, both statements are amazing. You want somebody who's not trying to ingratiate himself or herself. You want somebody that is not ready to see you fail so they can get your job. Such an amazing, can you imagine a chief financial officer who wouldn't give you good, honest, fully disclosing advice? I guess we've said we know human nature enough to know sometimes personal self-interest gets in the way of good decision making. That's a way of saying, and here's now a principle, for making good and timely decisions, having somebody at your elbow, well-informed, but able to give you an unbiased, non-self-serving, Catholic with a small c line of advice. A colleague, a professional colleague of mine has taken this into the research terrain. I offer up her formulation very briefly here. If you've been through the Stanford engineering program or the B school, that is I think up the street from here, uh, you may have run into Cassie, uh, Kathy Eisenhardt. Does anybody Worked with Kath Kathy Eisenhart. This is what she did, great study. She went out uh, in this vicinity, found a bunch of hardware and software makers, put them into two buckets, the slow movers and the fast movers. Slow movers would take eight months to get a product out the door that the fast movers would take four months. Product was no better, just took more time. By the way, which bucket is Google in? Okay, the fast movers, I see some uh, super fast. You're over actually way over on this side of the screen. So let's see, take a look at that third bullet right there. One of the findings, inductive. She's like an ethnographer in anthropology. What's the difference between the fast movers and the slow movers? And she found that the fast movers tended to have decision makers like your own, like you, who had on the inside, look at the phrase, an experienced counselor unbiased, non-self-serving, not an outside McKinsey or BCG or Bain, but an insider. Take a look at the next one. This breaks my heart coming from Quaker Philadelphia, where consensus is king or queen. She found that at the fast movers, they were ready to take action without 100% consensus being formed around the decision yet to be made, partial consensus. I have another way of getting at this and if you look very carefully for extra credit, you can find Evan Wittenberg on screen here. Yeah, just a little bit right of center, crouching down, your own Evan Wittenberg. Uh, th this is the learning formula, so to speak, that we acquire when we take our MBA students, 90 strong, twice a year, for a day and a half with the US Marine Corps. We do that not to turn them into Marines. We still want our tuition to be paid for two full years. We do this though so that we can learn about huh, good and timely decisions under a lot of pressure, which is what the Marine mission is all about. Get in, get the job done, do it well, and get out. And Evan and others here are hearing a four-point formulation. Good and timely decision-making. Check it out. Just look at the statements here. Number one, an officer, 
this goes back to what we were just talking about. An officer goes for 70% assuredness, 70% confidence, 70% due diligence, 70% agreement. Not 50, but not 99. 70%, a little bit of an artificial, overly specified measure. Ann Livermore, some of you have worked with her over at Hewlett Packard, she often talks 60%. It doesn't matter, it's a metaphor for getting a lot of the way there, but not letting perfect get in the way of a timely decision. Look at the next line. Learning to be totally clear-minded to the staff that works for you, unambiguous about intent, don't try to micromanage, assuming you've got great people on your team. That leads to the third statement there, which is this. You have to develop a tolerance for error obvious. If we're going for 70% confidence analysis, we're going to make mistakes. You have to develop a tolerance for errors. But there's a caveat on that not stated, but it's pretty obvious. Allow people who work for you to make an error once. Ask them to report to you that they won't make that error again because now, now they know about the error of their way. So error First time, a great source of schooling. Second time, that's a serious mistake that we can't allow to stand. Mistakes are tolerated first time. Fourth statement is this. Indecisiveness is fatal. I'll make that a little bit more softly put. In a position of leadership, if you are indecisive, you have unequivocally probably taken the, the wrong vow for your career. Now, this is a bit of a formulation. I said we're coming to a final exam here. Have we missed anything by way of, and I tend to call it a template, a set of guidelines for yourself. We've had four people describe theirs. Here are a couple of thoughts, prior screen from the world of academe, US Marine Corps. Is there anything else that we ought to keep in mind? when it comes to guiding ourselves on how to make good and timely decisions. Yes? You're going to have to walk up here and get you on the air. Uh, you know, how often preparation has been one of the key to making decisions? You know, how often have you faced that situation? Uh, is this the first time? If it is the first time, I think you'll look for more data. But if you've been in that situation before, you'll be able to ask the right questions. And also, I've been able to integrate probabilities. You know, how much information do you need to be more than 50% right? You know, do you need 100% information, or you know, can with this information, can you be confident that you know you're 70% right at least? Yeah. And then you can go make a decision. Let, let me let me pick up on that. Many of you have read the great book by Malcolm Gladwell called Blink. It's all about decision making. Uh, he makes, there's a secondary point in there which is sometimes overlooked. He makes the argument that intuition is extremely valuable, but it's only as good as it's informed by your past experience. And in my own view, the best people out there for making decisions are those that look back on decisions they have made and others have made, and you stick that into the back of your intuition so that it's an informed intuition. After action review, looking back on everything, I'll make this very tangible. I'm going to come to the final exam now in 60 seconds. I interviewed the chief executive a couple years ago of Lenovo, the big PC maker. I bought the IBM PC line back in 05. World's fourth largest PC maker these days. Uh, Lu Chanzi is his name. I said, how did you ever get into running a company because you began as a computer scientist for the Chinese Academy of Sciences? And he says, I got a pretty good intuition because every Friday I sit down with whoever reports to me. We go over every decision during the week. What was good? What was flawed? How can we do better next week? No formal training, no MBA, no nothing. But self-training created an intuition which has been pretty good. Final exam. Here we go. Take all that we've said. I'm going to take us to a fateful day 1865, I'm going to skip over a bunch of things here. It's going to make it a little bit dizzy. Pardon me on this. Oh, wow, we're getting dizzy here. Fateful day. This is April 9th, 1865. Robert E. Lee survives. 
wins on the peninsula back in 1862, never gives up command. Lincoln was replacing generals every few months. Once Lee takes command, remember the date, June 1st, 1862, he never gives up command because he was as good as they come. But he's defeated, finally, near Appomattox, Virginia. April 9th, 1865, Lee surrenders. Many paintings, no photograph, I've got one shown here. He surrenders to Ulysses S. Grant. Grant, in his wisdom, sends a telegram. President Lincoln, I have the privilege of announcing to you that the South's biggest army led by one Robert E. Lee, has unconditionally surrendered today Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia. What's, Lee, what's Lincoln's next thought? Put yourself in the mind of the man now in the White House. When you hear, when you read that telegram, comes over from the War Department, what's your first thought? What should be your first thought as the leader of the country? Uh, <laughs> celebrate the end of four years of absolute human carnage and the fact that the Union now has been restored. And to focus on that, having fought, this was almost total war for its era. Think Atlanta, think Sherman's campaign. We now have to reconcile. That's up in Washington, back to Appomattox, Virginia. In an odd move, Ulysses S. Grant picks a non-career officer who had taken leave from Bowdoin College where he, would, he was teaching English and speech, a guy named Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. Anybody from Maine will know that name. And he says, Grant ch to Chamberlain, a mid-level officer, temporary, he says, uh, Chamberlain, on April 12th, I'm going to give you the historic distinction of the formal surrender of the army of Robert E. Lee. I order you to do the following. You're going to stand at the edge of a field, 4,000 men in blue and a few women are going to be at attention behind you. This is ceremonial now, three days later after the signing. And all the Confederate units, a day of ignominy, have to come up to where you're standing. They have to give you their flag, what's called the colors, for their unit and their weapons. You have to take them. Everything else is up to you. So here's the final exam. Got to think of it. We're almost out of time. Got to think about this quickly. You're Chamberlain. You've been given the intent. Go back to that Marine Corps formulation. But all the decisions now within that intent are up to you. So how would you script the formal surrender of Robert E. Lee's army? What would you do? Somebody give us a quick voicing. I'll put it on the air here. Well, it depends on what you want to achieve. What's the whole point of the surrender? Yes. The statement here is welcome home. And that is almost a perfect way to sum it up. We hereby defeat you, but the objective of this war was not to do that, but was to bring you back home. So today is a moment of reconciliation. Ah. Now, we've got to take that and bring that down tactically. So we're going to make a decision to reconcile, not humiliate. We've got to bring that down tactically. And let me just reference how that is done with the following final image. And we're now through the final exam, successfully completed. These are the 4,000 soldiers lined up here. This is Chamberlain, the temporary officer from Maine. Hard to see, but in the lower left hand, almost spec place of this image is the first Confederate unit that's coming up a day of ignominy as far as they're concerned. Chamberlain, without permission, but that was Lee's, that was Grant's purpose, get the intent, you make the decisions, tells a subordinate, carry arms. Many of us know the term present arms. It's a formal military posture. Carry arms one notch below that in parade formation, but only given when you want to show respect, great respect, normally only given to a Union officer, a general who's come onto the scene. Chamberlain tells his number two guy, carry arms. The word goes down, 
the 4,000 people sh so displayed suddenly move. Musket comes over here, left hand across the stock. The Confederate officer coming down that muddy lane, same tradition, they all come out of West Point, more or less, says to himself, whoa, carry arms. I guess that's, that's for us. So he, in turn, still a little bit of authority left. They're about to be disbanded. He turns to his own subordinate number two officer and says, carry arms. In the history of the Civil War, this becomes known as the salute, returning the salute. In the years after the end of the war, you mentioned the name Sherman anywhere in Georgia, and people are going to get uh, red in the face all over again. Some of you I know are from the South. If you mention the name Chamberlain, those who knew about this incident would say, Chamberlain, he was one of those people that displayed us with respect. Let's see, what does Lincoln want? He wants to bring them back in. That's the intent. No evidence that Chamberlain ever met Abraham Lincoln. But with that intent known, reconciliation is required. A decision is made April 12th by Chamberlain for respect to be displayed towards the defeated Confederate Army. Maybe that's a way to, s uh, maybe one way to sum this up, decision making. Think the Marine Corps four point formulation. Think Kathy Eisenhart's five point formulation. Think the four people who have nicely reported what they put into their decisions. Read books like Malcolm Gladwell on that. And maybe to all that, how about this as a final parting shot? Don't you want people working for you when they make good and timely decisions ultimately to think like a president, to think like you own the company, to think like everything hangs on you? And I think that with a guideline, hopefully people working for you in their own leadership will give you what you want and the company needs. My pleasure. May you all decide. Thank you very much.